The progress update part of this devlog will be pretty short, but since most people wanted to see more implementation details, I'm going to spend the rest of the video talking about how I built the UI for this game, and I'm going to share some tips that I hope are going to be helpful to other developers. I didn't get as far as I hoped to this week, but I have fixed all the bugs I've found so far in the ship movement at least, and I've added some features to the location editor for things like multiple platforms, nudging the entry and exit paths so that I can avoid clipping with the station, and finally a way to position locations on the map. But this isn't the UI I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to focus instead on the main in-game UI. This is actually an older build from a few weeks ago, but the UI hasn't changed. I'm going to start by looking at how I swap in these tabs for the space station view. I've laid them all out to the right of the view area, side by side so that they're easier to work with in the editor. Each of these tabs belongs to a group, called UI Station Panel. When I click any of these buttons, I iterate through all the panels, and the logic goes like this. If it's the target panel that I've just selected, and it's off screen, I'll outline the button, make the panel visible, and animate its process of moving onto the screen. Otherwise, I'll animate moving it off the screen, and if it has a method to react to closing it, I'll call that method. I also go through all the sibling buttons and make their outlines invisible. So let's talk about how these animations work. Rather than operating on their position, I operate on margins. This is necessary when using anchors to keep items positioned correctly as the screen resizes. Let's look at the shop panel for a specific example. It's anchored to the top right of the screen as shown by the screen indicator. Specifically, both the left and right sides of this panel are positioned relative to the right side of the viewport, and the top and bottom are both positioned relative to the top of the viewport. If I wanted the panel to get wider as the viewport gets wider, I could make the left side relative to the left of the screen. Or if I wanted to center it, I could use 0.5 for both the left and right. However, you can see that it's not centered now because it's only relative to the center of the screen. After positioning the anchors where you want, you still need to position the panel relative to the anchor. But let's undo all that. The actual animation is done on the C++ side, although it could have been done just as easily in GDScript. The juice method you saw earlier just adds the animation to a list. Then once per frame, I advance every animation in the list. I've tried to keep this as general purpose as possible, allowing me to animate any property that has a numeric value. And this formula is used to make a smooth start and stop to the motion. As you can see, cosine is well suited to this because it starts with a gradual change in Y position that speeds up and then eventually slows back down. Now let's look at these tables. This is probably the most complex example. These headings are just labels that respond to a click. They call into the native DLL to resort the data. Although again, this could have just as easily been done with GDScript. The function being called is defined by an exported variable here, in this case, shop sort. Then the name of this specific heading is passed in to identify what it should be sorted by. I also iterate through all the headings to change their color to highlight which one is selected. Now here's how it's implemented on the C++ side. First, I identify the enum value for the name that was passed in. If it's different from the current sort, I update the sort method and call refresh. Refresh then rebuilds every list in the shop panel from scratch, which is a little bit wasteful, but it's fast enough that it doesn't really matter. To start, it clears the lists, and this helper method just iterates through all the children and deletes them. Next, for the inventory list, it counts up all the items on the game board in your ship, and if you're including equipped items, it also counts everything that your crew are carrying. Then it applies the sort. Next, it builds and sorts the shop list, then clears and populates the dropdown for item category. Finally, let's look at how these lists are put into the UI. For each table in the UI, I have a row scene, which has all the fields for that row. I instance the scene and then place it vertically according to its position in the list. For each subsequent row, I just increment this Y value. These fields are set for the drag and drop behavior, which I'll get to shortly. I add the row as a child of the panel holding the list, and then I set the content for its fields. Set to fit is a helper method I put on some labels to help truncate their content in a nice way. I also remember what row was last selected and reselect it. Finally, in case the list needs scrolling, I update the minimum size of the panel containing the rows. However, I need to make sure that it's not smaller than the scroll box, so if you drag and drop into the empty space, it can react accordingly. The shop list works almost exactly the same way, just with different fields. Let's take a quick look at set to fit. This is a placeholder instance of my row scene, just to help lay out the UI. If we look into the scene, we'll see a script on some of these labels. As you can see, I have an argument for deciding whether or not to add an ellipsis to the text when a word is dropped. To make the text fit, this while loop measures the width of the string as rendered, using the current font of the label. 
If this is wider than the label, I cut off the last word and try again. However, if there are no more words to drop, it may exit this loop while still being too wide. In that case, we fall down to here and start cutting off individual letters. When cutting off parts of a word, I always add the ellipsis. Okay, so drag and drop. This part gets a little bit complicated. As you can see, I have my row scene within a panel within a scroll container. The row script enables dragging by implementing get drag data. Whatever you return here is what's passed to the object where you drop it. In this case, I'm using the same object I use as drag preview, which is a visual representation that something is being dragged. This is the scene I'm using. After creating an instance, I set the icon, label, and description. And then these two properties are used to help know what to do with it when it's dropped or released. If you look at the script on this drag preview, you'll see that when it's about to be deleted, it notifies its creator to cancel the drag and drop. That's because I gray out items when I start the drag motion and restore them to normal if you cancel. Now let's take a look at one of the places you can drop things. To receive drag and drop, you need to implement two methods. Can drop data returns true or false depending on whether or not the drop is valid. For instance, it's meaningless to drop from the shop list back to the drop list, but you can drop to the inventory or the crew info panel. They may have noticed this drop hint setter. As you can see, I changed some text on the tile to indicate what will happen when you drop, but I want this hint to clear as soon as your mouse moves off of that target. So this list holds a reference to the preview, and when the mouse exits, it resets the hint. However, I need to be careful not to do that if the preview has already been destroyed. That's why the preview holds reference to whoever last sent the hint text. And when that preview is being deleted, it tells the hint setter not to reset it on mouse exit anymore. So the last piece of this puzzle is drop data. This is where you actually act on the completed drag and drop. And of course, what you do here is completely up to the context of your UI. In my case, I call into a different method in the native DLL depending on where it was dropped from. Inventory to shop will sell something that's loose on the ground, while selected unit to shop will sell something that's currently equipped. The rest of this UI is mostly more of the same. There are some smaller things I could go into another time if people are interested, but this seems like a good place to stop. So that's all for this week. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions about the UI or any specific requests for what to talk about implementation details of next week. I'll also be trying once again to finish off the gameplay flow. In the meantime, it always helps me out if you hit the like button, spread the word, and subscribe if you haven't already. And of course, thanks for watching.